you are listening to the IFH Podcast Network. For more amazing filmmaking and screenwriting podcasts, just go to ifhpodcastnetwork.com. Welcome to the Bulletproof Screenwriting Podcast, episode number 82. You must stay drunk on writing so that reality cannot destroy you. Ray Bradbury. Broadcasting from a dark, windowless room in Hollywood, when we really should be working on that next draft, it's the Bulletproof Screenwriting Podcast, showing you the craft and business of screenwriting while teaching you how to make your screenplay bulletproof. And here's your host, Alex Ferrari. Welcome, welcome to another episode of the Bulletproof Screenwriting Podcast. I am your humble host, Alex Ferrari. Now, today's show is sponsored by Bulletproof Script Coverage. Now, unlike other script coverage services, Bulletproof Script Coverage actually focuses on the kind of project you are and the goals of the project you are. So we actually break it down by three categories, micro-budget, indie film market, and studio film. There's no reason to get coverage from a reader that's used to reading tentpole movies when your movie is going to be done for $100,000. And we wanted to focus on that at Bulletproof Script Coverage. Our readers have worked with Marvel Studios, CAA, WME, NBC, HBO, Disney, Scott Free, Warner Brothers, The Blacklist, and many, many more. So if you need your screenplay or TV script covered by professional readers, head on over to CoverMyScreenplay.com. And guys, I have a special treat for you. If you are interested in getting a three-part video series on screenwriting and how to write blockbusters in Hollywood today by some Oscar winners, some multi-billion dollar screenwriters, all you got to do is head over to bulletproofscreenwriting.tv forward slash free video series. Sign up for it there and you will get three amazing videos, almost an hour in length total in your inbox. So just head over to bulletproofscreenwriting.tv forward slash free video series. Now, guys, today on the show, we have indie film screenwriter and director Joshua Caldwell. Now, Joshua has been a three-time returning champion on the Indie Film Hustle podcast, but I wanted to bring him on to this podcast to talk about his screenwriting process. He started off with a $6,000 feature film, then gradually went up to a $100,000 feature film, and now uh, he's graduated even higher with his new film, Infamous, starring Bella Thorne, which just got released theatrically in the midst of COVID. So that was a great conversation as well. But I wanted to kind of dig into his indie film screenwriting process because writing for independent film is a lot different than writing for the studios or writing for you know big production companies. If you're doing something indie that you're trying to get produced at a low budget, let's say, 250000 and below, you have to change the mindset about how you're constructing the story. You have to think about budget. You have to think about scenes and how you work all of that together to actually position the script to get produced. Because I've seen a lot of you know independent film scripts that have large crowd scenes or large set pieces or big action sequences. And at the budgets that they're looking at, the chances of them getting produced from a new or young writer is nil. So this episode is really going to help you think about how to approach writing an independent film so you can actually get it produced. So without any further ado, please enjoy my conversation with Joshua Caldwell. I'd like to welcome to the show Joshua Caldwell, man. How you doing, brother? Good. How are you? I'm good, man. I'm good. You are a returning champion on the Indie Film Hustle podcast, but this is... The first appearance first on time. The, Bullet, the Bulletproof Screenwriting Podcast. And uh, it was, it, I thought it would be very interesting to have you come on um, from your, um, your background in the industry. It's, uh, I think you have a very unique perspective. So for the audience who don't know who you are, sir, can you tell us a little bit about how you got into the business? Yeah. Um, so I'm a writer, director, producer, and um, I started making films when I was younger in high school um, and ended up going to Fordham University in New York City, where I studied. I didn't study film. I just kind of started making movies on my own. And one of those movies was a short film called The Beautiful Lie, which I got nominated for and won an MTV Movie Award, um, Golden Popcorn, back in 2006. And that kind of 
kicked off my desire to move to Hollywood because originally I wasn't going to, you know, and I basically was like, all right, now I got to move to L.A. and I'm going to be the shit and I'm going to be like the big – they're going to give me the key to the Because you the have the golden, the golden popcorn. Because I got the golden popcorn. I mean, obviously. And everybody saw it. Um, <laughs> and that didn't happen. And, uh, you know, so I started – writing scripts and trying to meet people and I eventually interned and then eventually landed a job at um, working for Anthony Zyker, created CSI. And I worked for him for a couple of years as an exec and then started directing on my own. And I've been directing, basically writing directing since 2013. So the lesson of that story is that the golden popcorn does not open the doors that you might have thought it did. Not open, yes, exactly. <laughs> does not. I actually, I actually... <laughs> But it's in fact not a you know, it's uh, it's no, funny. But here's the thing you know, it, it, it was one of those things where you think you get this thing, you go, you're on the MTV Movie Award, oh, you're yeah. on the MTV Movie Awards, right? And of course, like in the press release, they leave off your category, and <laughs> uh, and so nobody really knows. I got so much, I got like not so much, I got some interest from managers and stuff. Um, when they announced the nominees because it, there was a big announcement in the Hollywood Reporter or Variety or something like that, mm -hmm. and I was actually listed there. But then when they announced the winners and they had the winners' um, press release, they didn't put that category in. And, like, the thing is about the movie <laughs> awards, is it's hilarious because you've got, you know, you win Best Kiss, like, who gives a fuck? You know, like, you win – you win best movie. Who cares? Nobody cares. It's like a popularity contest. But like I was this kid just out of college. Yeah, I was going to say you must have been a kid. Yeah. Like and you get a thing for a best film on campus, best student film. Um, you know, it's like you think it's like a cool big deal. And oh, it's a up, huge deal. dude. I couldn't even imagine yeah. what would have yeah. happened to my head oh, if I would have so gotten it. <laughs> Oh, you saw I like I, I, look at that. Look yeah. at that. 2006. I'm going to put that right next to uh to my blockbuster award. Uh that yeah, I uh, <laughs> choice. People's, people's um <laughs> No, listen, I, 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 to be fair, people's choice awards a little bit grander. Yeah, exactly. <laughs> but it doesn't open the doors that it used to, sir. <laughs> right, right, exactly. So, um <laughs> But you know, I what I talk about, I've talked about this with some people. I don't know as much anymore, but it was it was um, it was such a great lesson in humility. <laughs> it was about the because same. because you you come out, you think you're going to be the hot shit. Oh yeah, you're not. And so very quickly, like very immediately, I was like, okay, like I could, you know, just because I won this thing, it doesn't mean anything. And the only thing that's going to get me somewhere is the work, you know? And so then I really, I put the popcorn, I like kind of pissed off, but I put it under my bed, like wrapped it up and was like, fuck this thing. <laughs> and then, but you know, and then really started just hustling and working my way up and trying to get what I could and just never put myself in a position where I was, I was relying on accolades. So it's a very good lesson early on to say like, none of that matters. And, and I was bitter about it for a while because I was like, well, something should have happened. You know, something should have something should have happened. Um, and I did get a manager out of it for a while, like a junior manager who's a great guy. But um, still, at the end of the day, you just feel like, you know, I was a little bitter about it. And then over time, I, I started seeing, OK, well, like that doesn't matter. You know, and you start to turn over and go, well, what is success? What's the goal? What do you want to be doing? And it takes 10 years, but eventually you get to that place where the success is doing the work. You know, it's not whatever that response to the work ends up being because you can't control that. All you can control is what you're doing, which is either writing or directing or whatever it is that your your thing is, you know. But, yeah, so I, I, made, I got the movie award. It was really cool at the time. But then really I, I came out to L.A. I moved out to L.A. and I just started, you know, cranking. I just started trying to, to take whatever I could and get whatever I could doing music videos and writing scripts and writing script after script and, you know, getting one option and then not going anywhere and, and kind of doing the whole, the whole thing for a long time. So, so getting an option and then not being produced, that's a, that's a rarity in Hollywood, obviously that doesn't happen very often that you get the option and it doesn't get produced or that. You exactly. get an option. Yeah. Well, exactly. I, they, they didn't pay money for it. So that's <laughs> Oh, that's what. All right, so let's let's go. So let's take it's a this free back option. First. Oh free option. God. Okay. No, so, you know what? It was it was it was one of those. I didn't I didn't necessarily mind it because it didn't feel predatory. 
Sure. It was with uh, it was with um, um, Todd Komernicki who produced uh, um, what the Elf. Okay. Will. And like really great guy, like really knows his stuff, like has be you know is a friend now and and that kind of thing. But it was just one of those things where it was like oh, and then the other the other great thing about all of this was literally moved out to L.A. October two thousand six, and then boom, writer strike. And it just completely changed everything in Hollywood. And we were trying to get stuff made after that, you know, and it was like this was one of those movies. It was I'm going to put it out there because maybe somebody will want it. But it was called Glory Days, the <laughs> Saga of Chet Steele. And for anybody that's seen my movies, this is going to be all so out there. But it was the second movie we wrote, my writing partner at the time and I. And basically it's um, the story is it's about this guy named Chet Steele, who in high school was a hot shot quarterback. Right. He was like one of the best high school quarterbacks in Texas. And 20 years later, he's the bum sitting up in the stands, you know, loser, typical formula. Right. But then what happens is he finds out this new hot shot quarterback named Cody Powers is going to. Of course, his name is Cody Powers. (laughs) Is on track to beat his all time passing record. Mm -hmm. And what Chet doesn't understand is that his record is not a permanent record. He doesn't understand that it can't, somebody can't come in and beat it. And when he finds that out, his whole world gets shattered. And basically through a loophole in the no child left behind act, he's able to go back to school because he never, (laughs) he didn't graduate. So he goes back to high school, rejoins the football team at 40 years old. And now of course the team sucks. And so he has to get them better in order to protect his record. And along the way he learns the, importance of teamwork and uh, of course of course uh, oh that's you know, so just just the, our pitch was it's will ferrell and shoulder pads pads playing football with college, with high school kids you know and the thing about it was we wrote it so specifically that everyone that read it was like well unless you get will ferrell there's no way to get this <laughs> made we're like no there's other people that could do this like that actually would be a, a funny will ferrell film i have to it i have to admit it, it, have, it so would be with a, todd Todd, the thing was, we thought, okay, like, look, maybe they give us a couple grand, you know, for an option. Who cares? Like, I got the experience of working with Todd on doing sure. some notes, doing yeah. the rewrite, working with a real producer, and also, like, he had made a movie with Will. Mm-hmm. You know, that's so a very thought, successful oh, film. Probably the best chance we have, but of course, the problem that we ran into was post writer strike. It just disrupted everything, and so everyone was like, well. If you don't, it was the age old thing, but it was even harder now, which was like, well, if you don't have an actor, you can't go after Will until you have money. You can't go after money until you have an actor. Nobody wants to touch it. So it ended up dying, unfortunately. But that was like one of our second experiences in Hollywood. So what was your, how did you get your first paid writing gig? God, what was my first paid writing gig? I'm trying to remember. I think it was actually more recently. Um, Let me think about this. I've I just had a weird I've had a weird career. I've never I've only sold technically one script, which mm-hmm. was infamous. Mm-hmm. And that's sold to the producers, basically. Um, because I'm not a spec writer. Right. You know, like I, I'm not going out and just writing spec after spec after spec trying to get it sold. We did, and I used to. What was my first first paid thing? I'm trying to think. I don't think I made very much, even if it was something. Um Oh, you know what? It was like kind of in, I think it was in 2000. As a writer, I got paid to uh, like nothing money to try and adapt a graphic novel. Okay. Um, which uh, didn't end up going anywhere. Um, and probably rightfully so because I wasn't quite right for it. <laughs> uh, <laughs> but it was like it, it, that, if you want to know how that came about, that came about from – um, you know, I recently signed with CAA. So this was in 2016. So yeah, 2016, I mean, you know, 10 years before I really got my first job, you know, first paid thing as a writer. So, so that's how you got it. And that's, and how did you get the attention of CAA? So, well, it's almost like you got to go all the way back, you know, okay. to the beginning, but basically I'd had a manager for a while and, um, went through, you know, script after script and, and short after short. And eventually, you know, I started, um, I did a couple shorts, I got some experience and then really it was the thing that really kicked off my career was layover. 
Layover was the thing that started everything. You know, in 2010, I made a, a short film called Dig, which I still think is some of my best work. Um, but it was like 26 minutes long, it, you know, and it just never went anywhere in terms of in terms of festivals. You know, it never mm. got me anything. But it was a great experience. I spent, you know, it cost like 40 grand to make it, which mm-hmm. is ridiculous. I've been there. But it, <laughs> but it was period, you know, and you wanted good actors and whatever. And you wanted five days of shooting. So I you know, basically did that. And then I made a $6,000 French indie movie with no stars. And that's the thing that got, has gotten me every job directing so, or writing. Okay, okay. So that's a cool, it's okay. So, cause we, we, and I'll put that in the show notes. I mean, you've done about, uh, you've done two episodes that have aired. Yeah. That have aired on, uh, on indie film hustle. So the first one was about layover, which was basically a $6,000. Oh, You've now. done three. The third one layover, hasn't really released yet. And, and, and yeah. Correct. Yeah. So layover um, was a six thousand dollar feature, and that's how we yeah. met originally. Because right. um, I'm always fascinated by low budget, micro budget films that actually are successful in one way, shape, or Me form. Too. Still, I still don't know how that. <laughs> <laughs> so still, I don't know. <laughs> so you wrote that, but you wrote it. You translated it all in French. Yeah. So I wrote it. I wrote it in English, and and you know I'd written with a partner for years. You know mm-hmm. I came out because I always felt like I was a writer who. I was. I felt like I was a director who uh, wrote, as opposed to a writer who directed. And I like the idea of working with a partner. But like anybody, you start to get an itch, and you start to go, "Oh, maybe you know, maybe this I'd want to write on my own, or or you know, maybe I want to try something." And layover was the first thing where I I kind of went into it, going, "I'm just going to start, and then if I peter out after 30 pages, then I'll bring someone else in," you know. But I just basically sat down and pounded it out. You know, I did it in about two weeks and I just kept going. And that was a weird because I sort of knew the beginning and the end, but the middle I kind of made up. Like the whole concept of the motorcyclist just came out of nowhere. I was like, she's just going to meet a guy. And then I'm writing, writing, writing. I'm like, oh, what if he's on a motorcycle? What if it's this? What if it's this? You know, and and that script, script, the first draft of it really came together by actually typing it, not typing up outlines and, and all that kind of stuff. Um, but I wrote it all in English. And then Carl Landler, who plays the motorcyclist, uh, who is from Paris, uh, he basically did all the translation from the script, which is why in the movie I gave him I gave him credit as translation by, you know, uh, on on the same card as my I think on the same card as my screenwriting credit. So I felt like he was so contributive. I mean, you know, it's like a whole other language, not just like Google Translate. Literally, literally a whole other language. Literally. (laughs) It's a completely different language (laughs) than English. (laughs) Um, so but no, but it's, what I'm saying is not just, it's not like you're just going to Google Translate and, and typing it in. No, like, you've got to – there's nuances, of course. Yeah, there's nuances and, and there's sayings that don't exist that in French that are in English, you know, and, okay, and you really so, have to, to make it work. So so I, have, I've, I don't think I've ever asked you this. Why the French? OK. So a couple years prior, there was a movie um, – what was it called? I think it was Maria Full of Grace. Yeah. And um, basically, I remember every single article about that movie was about the fact that the director did not speak Spanish and <laughs> did a movie in Spanish. <laughs> right? Right. Because you're, look, you're looking for that hook. Right? Yeah, you're it's something. You were trying to, you, you, you were trying to set up a, talk? you were setting, because you it's, were, no long, it's no longer, I made a movie. You know, right. nobody it's, cares that you made a movie. So I just, that was, that stuck in my head. Um, I was also, you know, look, I mean, layover is largely modeled after a French new wave approach to filmmaking. Right. Mm-hmm. But the other thing that stuck with me was just this notion that so often when you see a foreign language film, it's because it's set in the country where the language is spoken. Mm-hmm. And I just thought it'd be really interesting to see, a a foreign language film that's set in America. Mm -hmm. And would that, would that tweak somebody's, would that tweak somebody's into LA and their understanding of LA? If it's seen through the eyes of somebody that not only doesn't, isn't familiar with the city, but Mm -hmm. doesn't even speak the language. And so I just like the idea, all those things combined with the idea that for me, from a character perspective, um, the story of a girl traveling from New York to Singapore and she gets stuck over in L.A. is not that interesting. It's not that hard to find your way around L.A. and know what to do and know what's going on when you speak English. 
Mm-hmm. But if you don't speak the language at all, it can be an extremely confusing place to anybody who's ever gone to a different country. You mm-hmm. know, you don't know the customs, you don't know the language, you don't know what people are saying, you don't know what things are. And I just thought that would be a really interesting obstacle, you know, that would prevent certain things from happening that would be really easy to happen if she spoke English. Right. It's like, oh, I'm stuck in stuck in the city for a night. All right. I'm going to veg out and watch TV like, you <laughs> right. know. It's like she's stuck in the city, and and then she goes out with a friend. The friend speaks English, but she doesn't speak English. And then once she loses the friend, she meets a guy who speaks French, and she feels well. I don't I don't know what's going on. Like you know, my big thing was whether people were going to buy into her going with the guy. But Carl's really charming, so and it's know. also suspense of disbelief. A little suspense bit. of disbelief, but the fact that she speaks French and she meets a guy that speaks French, there's an instant comfort level. Sure, of course, right. And she goes with him in a way that she probably wouldn't if she was like, you know, an American. She meet another guy that spoke American. It would just be like weird, you know. So but that uh, just felt like a really interesting way into it. So there were a number of reasons. All right. So that movie, when you made that movie for six grand, um, you were able to you. I think you you did get distribution for the film, and you you made money with the film. Is that the film that got you CAA? No. So layover got me another movie. First of all, Layover got me a series on Hulu mm-hmm. uh, that I just directed. I didn't write it, but called South Beach. So I directed that next. And then Layover combined with the Hulu show got me a movie called Be Somebody, which was um, this made by this company it's called Studio 71, um, which they had another name before. I forget what it was. But anyway, um, and they – I pitched on it. I went in and pitched on it. And because I needed money, basically, (laughs) and uh, and got the job. And it was an influencer movie that starred this guy named Matt Espinoza, who had like 20 million followers online and never been in a movie before. And this movie kind of the script was from like the mid 90s and it had been kind of updated and refashioned. Um, But then one of the things about that and again, like it's weird because so often people talk about, well, I sold this script, right? Or mm-hmm. I got paid to write this script. But like I've written on every script that uh, every project I've made, mm-hmm. you know, I did writing on the Hulu show. I didn't get credit for it. I didn't get paid for it. Um, Be Somebody was a mess. Like what happened was I got pulled onto it and then I do a rewrite on the script. I do. I, I If I can, I rewrite every script that I direct because uh, it's how I get my fingers into it and it's how I get to know it. And it's, mm-hmm. I got to put my own thing onto it so far. I'm sure that won't happen when some huge writer is, you know, when you, when you, when you have your $200 million really dollar Marvel, Marvel, when you're working for Marvel, sir, not so much with the rewrites. Yeah. Yeah, exactly. <laughs> um, although maybe who knows, but uh, <laughs> the point is I felt, I felt compelled to do it, but this one was like, it needed to be done. I mean, it was already too long. The writer was not involved anymore. And, um, but it was 109 pages when I got it, they were like, we need to cut it. I'm like, yeah. So I cut 16 pages out of it to bring it down to 94. And (laughs) so then I give it to them and they come back and they're like, yeah, so we just did a budget on your script and it seems like we're like $200,000 over what we want to be. And I go, what was the budget on the other draft? What was 16 pages more? Yeah. And they go, oh, we didn't do one. So they never did a budget. They greenlit a movie without doing a budgeted script, budgeting the script. And then I had basically, and then I got this script that was still 200 over. And they're like, well, we got to make all these changes. And they're like, can we cut this? And I'm like, well, if you cut that, you have no ending. So then what's the movie about? Like, what's the whole point of the movie? So then literally for like a couple weeks up until we started shooting, me and this other exec at the company were basically rewriting it from scratch. I mean, we literally started over and we knew we had these characters because we already cast it, these locations because we were already scouting. And so the biggest, my biggest regret over that movie was basically we ended up shooting effectively the first draft of like a new script. And if you watch the movie, you see that there are like repeated like lines of dialogue and things that come up like when normally you'd have gone through Mm -hmm. and been like, Oh wait, we already, we already did this part, you know? And, but it was, it was writing under duress and it was basically a real interesting experience because you're like, you've got to go movie, you've got a job, right? Right. You want to make it happen. I was also trying to start, I had just closed a deal to do negative. And so I didn't want to push this movie, you know, but 
And, and so you're just like, I mean, literally the weekend of Thanksgiving, I was out here in New York, but I was down in my in-laws basement, like typing up drafts of the script and sending it off to the producer. Like every scene, we just send off a new scene to the producer. And so, you know, I think like, Clear, it was clear to me that this was not the way, the best way to make movies, you know, and I got really <laughs> tired of it. But for all my problems with that movie, one, um, there, I think it really speaks to a certain age group of, of especially girls mm-hmm. um, that I've heard from repeatedly that said, oh, we love, you know, I love Be Somebody. It taught me so much about this. And I love seeing like the multiracial family and you Mm -hmm. know you get a lot of feedback about the things that we chose to do in that movie that makes you feel like okay at least somebody's taking something from this you know but um the other thing and then the other thing was that that movie because it ended up getting bought and released by paramount got me caa got it and then there you go in conjunction with everything else that i was doing right i'd done a hulu show i'd done this yeah sure Um, you build you build and build and build and and i think this is what it happened was also really quick that the other thing was when i left zykers um i i also left my current my then manager because it just wasn't working out like Mm -hmm. he wanted to go he was doing other stuff and it was i was feeling like i was hip pocketed so as soon as i left i also started looking for a new manager and i got introduced to my current manager tom spriggs so he came he 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 i signed with him in 2013 right after i left you know um right after i left zykers and then that was a conversation we were having which was about agents and i kind of basically you know, as much as I wanted one, I was also starting to get to that place where I said, you know what, like F this, like, I'm not going to, I'm not going to even entertain the idea of an agent until they want me. Because if, if it's, uh, if I want them, then I'm always in that position of like need and, um, you know, uh, of desire, right? Like, and they know that you're in a weaker, but you're, you're in a weaker, you're in a weaker position. position. And if I just keep doing what I'm doing, eventually they're going to find me. And they're going to say, we, you know, we'd like to sign. But after Be Somebody, I was just like, I said to Tom, I'm like, you think now maybe we should start thinking about an agent? Because like I've got, I've done three movies now. I've got, I'm signing deals. Like I did a show for Hulu. Like, you know, maybe it's time. And he said, yeah. So we went out to a couple places, but CAA was always the top of the list because I had a lot of relationships there mm-hmm. from working with Zyker because he was rep there. So funny enough, like my agent, one of my agents now, Frank Jung, was a guy that I knew well from my time at Zyker's doing stuff in the digital world. So, so I think this is a really good point to, to, to bring up for the audience to understand about managers and agents because there is a, this kind of myth out there that all I need to do is get a manager and or an agent and I'm good. They're going to go out. They're going to get me work. I'm going to get paid. They're going to pitch me. They're going to I'm going to sell my scripts. I'm going to get the lottery ticket, million dollar buy, like, you know, Shane yeah. Black used to do back in the nineties and more. Yeah, and just like a bidding wars, and it's Joe Esterhaus, and it's all this kind of yeah. stuff, right? Um, yeah. But but the realities are, which is what you kind of just put out, is that you shouldn't. First of all, no agent's going to be interested into you in you until you are are able to generate revenue for them. Right. So you are a perfect example. Before these three projects that you did, or three or four projects you had done, uh, you had no true value to an agency right. because you weren't going to be able to generate revenue for them. So once right. you got like, oh, this guy, this is a ho- this is a horse that's can can win a couple races. That's basically yeah. it's it's as crass as that is. You're basically no, I mean, livestock. You're just like yeah, creative livestock. Because sometimes you know, and I also didn't have I didn't have some like spec script that people were flipping over, right? Exactly. You know, which is what it used to be too. Like if mm-hmm. you wrote a spec script that everybody was enamored with, then you'd have everybody calling you. But I didn't I didn't have that. And yeah, so you're just like, you know, look, the other thing is that it's, it's a transaction, you know, and the thing is, not only is it about, well, what do you have? What did you have? Right. Okay, great. Like the thing is great. He made a movie so he can demonstrate that he's got value, but what else does he have? What's next? Right. Oh, what everyone's going to ask you. Always. Always. What's next? Um, you know, and it was interesting because I, when I was going out for managers, um, I, I met with a couple people and there was one guy who wrote, you know, who got back to me and I remember just being like, I sat down with them and his whole thing was just like, you know, look, this, it's really hard, man. Like really tough. It's going to be what, you know, just this stuff. And I remember coming out of that going like, I know it's hard. Like I'm not a kid. (laughs) I'm not a kid. The question is, 
what are we going to be doing to try and do what we can do? I don't care if it's hard, you know, but th- I just recognize that attitude, you know, versus somebody saying, look, it's not going to be easy, but I have ideas. I have people we can set you up with. Like you clearly are demonstrating an ability to make low budget movies, which, you know, or spend very little money, which people are going to be attracted to. And we work your way up, you know, but I, th- I, I think that like anytime, I mean, look, and I'm guilty of this too, having not now been through it. I also think that if you're, if you are asking the question, how do I get an agent or a manager? You're not ready for an agent or a manager. Exactly. If you've got to ask the question, then you're not ready for it. You've got to ask the question. You're just not ready for it. And that's fine. But like if you're asking that question, that's a sign that now is not the time. You know, that you've got more work to do. You got more connections to make. You got to get your material out there. I mean, you know, even when I had a manager, like right after the movie award and like up until <laughs> 2013, right. like he was. He's a great guy. I love him. But he wasn't able to do a lot for me. You know, I mean, he'd get us in for some meetings. Um, you know, I remember that we um, one one opportunity I had that actually came out of this was I had this I met this guy and I've come to now think that his story is completely bullshit. But at the time, I thought it was true, um, which was he told me this story about how he was like this Israeli um, like kind of secret agent. Basically, the sure. little guy. Sure. Now a hairdresser in L.A. By the way. So it's, a, it's the Zohan. It's like, the Zohan. It's it's, yeah, it's, it's, exactly. it's, the, it's the Zohan. But like, got it. <laughs> he told us this really, really crazy story. Mm-hmm. And I was just like, man, this is a great idea for a script. And if we could call it a true story, then that's great. Mm-hmm. So I had this idea. I wrote. I wrote up like a, a sort of a pitch or whatever. And we actually went into we went into um, uh, participant media. Yeah. And they. So, and this is a thing that happens too. And I have to say like, I was okay with it, but what happened was we actually like went in there and it was me and a writing partner. And we said, well, we have this idea. And they said, we like it. We're not going to buy it or option it with you, but we'll develop it with you. And I said, all right, like I'm a young writer. I've got a job as an executive, so I probably shouldn't even be pitching. anyway. Right. But, uh, the opportunity and, and we retain the copyright. So, mm-hmm. we, you know, you guys haven't bought it. You're not paying money for it. You're helping us develop it. But we get we made that clear. Like we retain free use of the script if you guys decide not to do it. And we but, and we but we spent like a couple years like developing this script. And, and I'm sure it was rewrite. a learning. Le- and it was just it was just it was, school. A great learning it was school. You know, yeah. and that's the thing is like you get to get in and sit in a room with an exec that knows his shit. And you're just storyboarding and you're not storyboarding, but you're just putting down a story and coming up with ideas. And then you got to go away to do the work. So it's like such a it was such a great exercise, even though the script didn't end up selling and they didn't end up doing it. It was such a great experience having that because you don't you rarely get it. You know, so often writers are just they're they're off in their room, you know, doing nothing or not doing nothing. They're off in their room alone writing and you might get feedback. You might not get feedback. But we had like, you know, the goal was to get it to a place where they would buy it. You know, it wasn't like, let's just get it. So it's good. It's like, let's get it. So it's in a place where we can buy this. We didn't get there. It was a, it's a challenging story. And, you know, I probably well, I mean, going back my own but, ideas about how to change it, but, but you need to, you need to call uh, Adam Sandler's people. Cause he obviously stole the idea with, for don't mess with the cell. Well, his was a comedy <laughs> and ours was a, a drama. Probably ba- the guy probably met Sandler at some point and told him the story. And Sandler was like, we're going to, I'm going to, Oh yeah. That. And I'm going to eat a lot of hummus and that's just the way it is. Yeah. <laughs> Um, all right. So but, let me, you know, uh, so, but that but, was something that I, I came up with the idea. I told my manager about it. He pitched participant. He got us in the room, you know? And so that's an example of something happening, but it wasn't like, Oh, they bought the script or I sold the script. Or it's just so like I, I, I mean, I just want, I, and that's what I try to do on the show, man. The, you know, there's so many myths out there for, especially for young screenwriters or, you know, you know, people who are new to the business who just, they think that the business runs in a certain way and it just, doesn't and they don't understand yeah. and I'm not trying to be a killjoy but the difficulty of oh yeah getting something actually produced and getting yeah. credit for that and it's just this it's just this it's so difficult to do and what? it's not impossible and I don't want to be that no. guy that you were talking about like oh it's just really hard like it is it's super <laughs> it hard no question about it it's probably the, one There's... of the toughest things to do on the planet but yeah. I, but one thing I love about you is that You've been able to um, create your own projects, and you've been right. able to p- 
produce your own things, which brings me to my next question. Do you recommend young screenwriters or screenwriters starting out to write a low budget option for a screenplay that they could either produce themselves as the director and, or partner with someone who could produce it at a budget of 10,000, 15,000 right. to say right. that they have a produced script, a produced film. And does that actually have value in the marketplace as a screenwriter? It's a good question because I'm, I have like three things about it and two are the two sides of the same coin, which is, um, I think, I, I think that the more you as a writer can get produced and of course that's the goal, but I'm saying, even if it's a student film, a short, anything, the more experience you have seeing your work turned into a movie, the better you will be as a writer. Because when you write man falls out of a window, you have no concept of the takes. bullshit that is going to go into getting that on film. Right. Right? right. And and so you have then an understanding of, oh, this one line is a million dollar stunt. Right. <laughs> like I had a great, great, great example of this was when we were doing the glory days thing. Right. We had written this scene. Uh, it was a half page scene and it was Chet was out with the, the friends and it was part of a montage. But the idea was they were out at a burger restaurant and they're all laughing and having fun together, clearly becoming friends. Right. And I remember I remember the uh, producer, T Todd, was like, look, man. Like this, that's like a half day of shooting. That's a company move. And so what is it doing? Like he wasn't being mean about it. He was just like, what is the scene contributing to the movie that we don't already know? And does it have to happen at this location? Right. Because that's a half day of shooting. That's a company move. That's this much. And you're going, oh, yeah, like you're right. I wasn't thinking about that when I wrote it because you're not thinking about that stuff traditionally when you're a writer. But when you have the experience of seeing what it takes to not only bring what you wrote to life, but to see the level of collaboration that ends up going into that, right? The way in which actors come in with their own ideas that might be different than what you thought. The director comes in with a different idea than what, what you thought. Like the understanding that you need to be not only okay with it, but work with that, you know, to get the best out of what you can. Like that experience is invaluable. So that I think the more writers can see their work produced – whether it's a workshop, whether it's just like a table read, like hearing the actors say their lines, seeing what it takes to bring something to life is super important. The other side of it is like the question is, as a right as solely as a screenwriter, how much value do you get out of a, say, sub hundred thousand dollar budget movie? I'm not I'm not convinced there is that much because um, basically they just tend to be small dramas maybe if you wrote a sci-fi right like some people have done really or well an action the, 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 really good. or an action you know horror, some horror action. obviously horror yeah it might it's possible i can say that if it's a hundred hundred thousand dollar drama it's probably not valuable oh no <laughs> if no it's absolutely genre, if, if it's a genre, if it's a three million dollar drama it's going to generally not be valuable exactly. <laughs> unless meryl's in it it could be you know like i think if somebody just some separate writer had written layover it wouldn't have done anything for them you know um i just but don't you, think anybody would have said oh this guy can write something but because i was a writer director mm -hmm. it changed the conversation um the other side of it is that you more in that what you said living in that genre world and the idea that you also are then a produced screenwriter right which like is what everybody's trying to go for and hollywood is one of those one of those towns where People just – they want to have some comfort in knowing that you know what you're doing. And the easiest way for them to determine that is if somebody else has already given you money to do it, <laughs> right? right? Like, oh, this guy's already directed something. OK, good. You know, It doesn't matter whether it's good or bad. It's just the fact that you've done a feature says to them, OK, this guy did a feature. He didn't collapse. He didn't freak out. He didn't go massively over budget like, you know – he made something pretty good. Like, let's do the next thing. That's what they're always looking for. So even with writers, again, it's also not just the writing. It's like, who are you as a person? Are you abrasive and annoying and not fun to work with? Like, nobody's going to want to work with you.
Oh yeah, you know that's the that's the like, bottom. And the, I was like that too. I mean, I've been an ass in meetings about scripts, thinking that I was the shit, and that like you know what I wrote was like you know golden, you know the the written in golden ink, you know, and and you just very soon you get over that, you know, and you realize that no, like you know, I always thought like with Chris McQuarrie, Chris Chris McQuarrie always had that great response was was like the minute I stopped thinking about what I could get out of it, everything changed. Instead, it was how do I help you get what you want out of it. And then I'll do it in the best way that I can. Right. But it's not it's not, oh, I'm the smartest guy in the room and these are my ideas and this is what it's going to be, especially when you're starting out. Um, you know, but if you go in there and your goal is to deliver something that they can sell and make money on. People are going to want to hire you again. So I, th- I think any writing is valuable. I think like, look, if you've got an idea for a for a low budget genre movie or even hell, low budget drama, like do it. There's no, there's no reason to stop stop you. But the other thing is you got to think about, well, OK, well, me as a writer, what do I want to be? Right. Because say you get that under one hundred thousand dollar genre movie written, you know, no, say you have some drama that you really wanted to make. But then you've got a spec that's a hundred million. Yeah. Sci fi space epic. Right. No, not going to work. Yeah, and and also let's, yeah. let's just put that on the side. A hundred million dollar space epic that's not based on an IP that's existing already, or a toy, or some sort of thing, is not oh. going to get produced in today's Hollywood. It's just well. Mm-hmm. I don't even know if like I mean I just think like also it's tough. Like who's going to buy? You know it's weird because I know a couple people that have written these. They've written really big budget things I don't that know everybody that. Loved reading, but nobody bought it. Right, know? because they're not because that's not the studio. Right, they can't, that's get, not the, can't make. It. They're not but making what you're that. Taught, right. But what you're taught is, oh, write that high concept no. script. From what I think the new rules are is write a wonderful indie or write a good series or be a good writer on a series or something like that. And then possibly um, you'll get bumped up to a, a bigger budget situation to like if they like your voice or something like that to to write the next Black Panther or right. or, or that kind of scenario. But they're also looking a lot of those. I mean, re, have any of the Marvels not been writer directors? Like I'm, I'm I, I know sure. I'm sure that I don't know what they are, but a couple of them have. But but I mean a couple. I, I'm right off the top of my head. I have not. I can't think of a director of a Marvel film, I'm going through them in my head, that was not a writer on it and what either a co-writer or something right. like that. So yeah. that so it that might be true. I'm not as familiar with Marvel, but But any of those of any of the, any of those big, you know, epic studio projects, generally speaking, is a writer director. Um yeah. uh, it's int- yeah, it, it, yeah, the big epics, especially for the studios, uh, you know, unless you're like Pirates of the Caribbean or something like that, which right. is is different. But that's well, just, just the world we live in yeah yeah i mean so much has changed you know <laughs> and, and there's also now opportunities in that digital in the digital world you know like right smaller smaller stuff you know getting written i mean i don't know about with covid but you know for a while there there was a lot of lot of opportunity you know in the writing but i also think like one of the real challenges that i see um is just how tough it's got to be if you're just a writer you know, it's, like it's, just it's that idea. It's tougher than ever. I, I, like, I, I'm going to write, write a script, and that's all. I, all I want to be as a writer. That is that is a tough world, man. I've seen a lot of people bow out. You know, a lot of people I knew. You know, for a couple of years, like they just gave up because it was just very, very challenging. I, my feeling is, uh, this is just my opinion. I, I think that you, if you're a writer out there right now, try if you can't, if you don't want to direct and don't want to produce your own stuff. Partner with right. someone who can and make yeah. make low budget stuff and and start start small and start building up and and all of a sudden you have two three four five of these things under your belt then you start getting and then you all these kind of lower budget genre pictures or lower budget uh, streaming uh, series they will you have an opportunity to get, to get a foothold into that if you right. think you're going to be making the next Marvel. Forget it. If you think you're going to be making the big next studio movie, yeah. it's the competition for those jobs is so big. It's so competitive. Yeah. And there's basically, yeah. what are we talking about? hundred guys. And unfortunately yeah. they're mostly guys, um, you right. know, that are, are vying for those who have mm-hmm. $200 million plus films on their resumes. So 
You've yeah. got to work your way up there. I, that's my, I'm, I'm more of a, you know me, I'm an entrepreneurial, film entrepreneurial kind of right. guy like yeah, you yeah. are. So we, we just like, I'd rather have control of my own property. And yeah. at the end of the day, you have to ask yourself, what's the end goal? Do you just want to write for the writing's sake or do you want to make a living as a writer? And then there's right. a, two, two different approaches. Yeah. And it just takes time. You know, mm-hmm. it takes, takes a lot of, a lot of filled scripts. A lot of starts and stops, a lot of ideas that just don't pan out, you know, and sometimes you got to go down and get a script written, even if it's not the best idea, because you got to have the experience of having written it, mm-hmm. you know, and, um, and, uh, you know, and it's about getting feedback. It's also about being, you know, I think the other thing too is like, you know, it's also about being in a place where you can start making connections. You know, if you don't have that There's agent, that. you don't have that manager, like, you know, contests can only take you so far, mm-hmm. you know? Um, and, uh, you know, as a writer, there's a lot of benefit to being in LA, you know, um, you have to spend your time here in terms of purely being a writer, you know, you've got to spend your, otherwise, you got to do your yeah. time. I, look, I'm not yeah, saying you can't, I, I've interviewed people on the show before who, who've made a living selling scripts that are outside of the Hollywood system. It's rare. Right. Um, but right. it does happen. But if you want to play the game, you've got to be where the, where the players are, unfortunately. Yeah. And, and yeah. I think everyone, even if they like you, you spent time here, you, you did your time. Right. You have right. to, you're sentenced to, to live in LA for a certain period of time, and then after that, you can either stay here for the rest of your life, or you can move or to get out, yeah. or move to a more reasonable place to live. Um. <laughs> yeah, but you know, I mean, it was like it, it, you know, and it's funny because like with with the glory days, yeah, like that we got that to Todd because I was in an internship, and I was just talking to the guy who was the assistant there. Guy named David Clark, who's a friend now, mm-hmm. um, but he was like, he was just talking about it. I was like, oh, you know, I'm a writer. Like, I want a movie award, and uh, you know, I, <laughs> I love that you just threw that in there. <laughs> well, yeah, because you got to, right? I'm like, I'm an intern, you know, right. I'm not getting paid, right, right. But, um, but I was, you know, if I warmed up to the person, I would tell them. Otherwise, I'd try not to say anything. But uh, of course, you know, um, basically, like I just told him, I was, you know, I, oh, I've got a script. It's this, and he was like, oh, that's that's actually kind of funny. I'd like to read that. So I gave it to him, and then he was the one that got it to, you know, ended up going through the 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 rigmarole to get it to Todd. You know, um, and so even though it didn't lead to anything, it's still like that. That's a clear example. Like it could have, it could have sold huge. Like I have no idea, you know. And, and, it hap- and that does happen. That does happen. The being out there. Yeah. And, and that's also the importance of networking in this business. Right. It's so, so, so important to build out relationships, authentic relationships yeah. with people, authentic relationships with people. And I always tell people, like what Chris uh, McCary said, you, how can I be of service to you? How yeah. can I help you? Not, I need you to do this for me. Yeah. How can I be yeah, of there. service to you? And even yeah. he's huge and he still takes it with that kind of thing, you know, and that kind of attitude. Without question. Now, how do you, you, you've worked with a lot of studios and producers. How do you deal with notes as a creative? So, you know, it's interesting because I, how do I deal with notes? I, <laughs> I get the notes and then I yell and scream into mm-hmm. a pillow. Sure. Fair enough. And do some working out, punch things. Right. And then I settle. No, um, <laughs> I mean, I think that, I've learned to take, um, I've learned to just accept that everybody's trying to make the script better, right? right? There might be different versions of better, but everyone's just trying to, in some cases you're trying to contribute. And it's, it's a multi-pronged thing because sometimes notes are just a note to give a note, right? And they don't care about it. Other times they're like super passionate about it, you know? And so, what I usually do is I – the best method that I found is if you're doing a call or whatever, just take the notes. And if they ask for your feedback during the call, just say, look, like just give me the notes. Let me just absorb these and let me think about it and then let me come back to you if I have any questions, right? So you take all the notes and then you sit with them and then you just do the notes that you agree with. You know, so you, you implement those notes and then you give it back to them. And they're like, if, what about this? You're like, well, you know, I didn't feel that this one worked because then you make it a discussion. Right. You know, because most of the time um, they're not going to remember that they even gave you the note. 
um, depending on the level of investment that they have in the project, right? If it's working with a producer, then that's different than if it's working with an exec who's reading 50 scripts a night, you know? Mm-hmm. Um, but what I found is that if you, if, if you've shown that you can do the work that you'll, that you've implemented notes that you've taken what they've had to say, and you've done it in a way that you can, you think is best, they tend to let the stuff that you don't do go unless they feel very passionate about that, you know? Um, and so, but really it's, it's, it's kind of just going, well, what's the feedback? And it's different situations. Are you taking notes from a group of friends that you're just trying to get feedback from Mm -hmm. and you can blow them all off if you want to, or are you being ordered to implement this set of notes, you know? And so it's a fine line. I think like if you, if you disagree with something, you should feel free to stand up for it and explain why, um, you know, or you feel like you're not going to do that note justice because of these reasons. But I think like, you know, I say this now, which is like a good idea can come from anywhere. And I will 100% steal that idea if it's good. <laughs> Amen. Amen, brother. Preach. You know? Preach. And, and there's also just – there's so many steps that you're going through, right? Like if you're in an early stage of doing a, a script, you're like, this. I just don't know about this scene, whatever. But you're like, we are 20 steps away from ever filming this scene. And so much can change between now. Oh, yeah. Right? So, so like, if it's a short-term gain, right? right. Like, it's going to make the exec happy. It's going to make this guy happy. Nobody's to say, because all then you do is go to the director and say, what do you think about the scene? The director's probably going to say, the scene fucking sucks. Like, <laughs> we need to change it. And then the director goes to the exec, we're changing this. And the exec goes, okay, whatever. You know what I mean? There's always, uh, there's, there's a politicking that goes on in film production, you know, that, that a lot of people don't have an ear for. Um, or an I for, and it can be really important in servicing you, you know, as you go through it. But, um, you know, it, it's a, it's a challenge, especially when you're really passionate about something, especially I but think I also found, less experience you have, the more passionate yeah. you might, oh, yeah. might be. <laughs> oh, and I say all of this, having gone through that thing where I said like, Oh, fuck you. Like, you don't know what you're talking about. Like, you know, I'm a genius. And, uh, this is a perfect a script. Why aren't you writing me a check right now? Right. Like total (laughs) total entitlement. But I think like notes are best served by just having some distance to them Mm -hmm. and then going like I the the best example I can give, because I I haven't had that many situations where I've really disagreed with notes in a script stage. But I had a situation with my producer on Infamous where we were in the edit and he was giving notes and there were some notes that I vehemently disagreed with. Like I was Mm -hmm. like, I absolutely disagree with these notes upon initial reflection. Right. Like literally it was like, none of these notes are good. I'm not doing any of them. And then what I did was I just took some space. I stepped back from it. Right. I put the notes down and went fishing, just let it sit. I came back and I said, all right, I'm going to see if I can even, let me just see if I can even do them. Right. Let me see if I can even do execute the note because sometimes people are giving you a note. They have no idea if it's doable. And then I go, okay, then how now? So I do them what I can. And I go, how do I feel about these? I'm like, yeah, I'm okay with that. I'm all right with that. Okay. This one I can live with, you know? And, and eventually I ended up doing in the process of, of the edit, I did like 60, I no, I probably did like 80% of their notes. And then the ones that I just didn't agree with, I just didn't do. And then when they saw the next cut, there were a couple that I hadn't done where they came back and said, we feel very strongly about this. And then we had a very, very passionate back and forth about it. And I ended up do, I ended up executing in a way that was a compromise between him and I, Mm -hmm. but then a lot of the other ones, he just kind of let go of, you know, and I felt like we ended up getting to a good place. And what it required though of me was stepping back and saying, okay, let me just see if I can even do it. Because am I, am I reacting to the fact that I'm being given a note Mm -hmm. or am I reacting to the note? Mm -hmm. Right. And it's very easy to let your ego get in the way and it for to be the first one and not the second one. Fair enough. And, and there might be some gems in there, you know, there might be some stuff that in there, like great example was at the, so spoiler alert for those that haven't seen it, but at the end of layover, originally we had her give the whole speech about what's going to happen when she arrives and meets her boyfriend. Mm -hmm. And then it cuts to the next morning and the next morning is just played over music. Right. And I had a buddy of mine who came to a screening. We just did a screening to see, to see what it was going to turn out like. And my buddy said, you know, and he's, he was an editor, but he said, you should try, you should try taking that last part, the montage of her, like going onto the plane and put that under the story. And I was like, yeah, 
I don't know, like maybe it's like, but good idea, you know, and it's kind of, it was kind of like, whatever, I don't know, just an idea, you know, but I was like, I was like, yeah, maybe I'll try it. You know, and I got, I, I was, but originally I was like, no, like, I don't mm-hmm. want to do that. You know? And then I just like, well, let me just try it. And I did it. And I was like, ah, I kind of, I kind of like that. Like that, that actually is really good, mm-hmm. you know? And, and I could have tried it and been like, yeah, it, it doesn't work as well for me, you know? And then gone back to the way I had it. But the act of just trying it opened up a whole new meaning to the movie for me and a whole new way of ending that film that I never would have thought of on my own, you know? And so that's why I say I'll take a good idea from anywhere and, and, and I'll steal it. And I'll make it mine. Now, your latest film, Infamous, uh, got released during COVID. Uh, how yeah. did, how did the, the drive in, I saw some numbers on it. It didn't do bad. It actually did. Okay. It did pretty well. Yeah. yeah. It's we ended done. Up being, yeah. We ended up being like number two, like right. we were the number one new movie, number two overall, you know, and it did, it did pretty good business over four weeks. Like it was, you know, I think it took in over 400,000. That's, you know, that movie. N- not bad at all. That's awesome. Yeah. Consider, and it was driving. I'll, I'll be- brutalized by some of the critics but <laughs> oh well that's just the way it is it doesn't matter yeah. um the critics are critics um we've yeah. all taken we've all taken our slicks anytime anytime i he- i get a bad review i always just go to uh go to google and i type in shawshank redemption bad review and mm-hmm. then i read those and then right. i go okay <laughs> yeah. Or, yeah or just write godfather bad review um, Star yeah. Wars well, bad review. <laughs> you know, the other thing is for me, what was so perplexing about it, that's, that's a whole other podcast probably. But mm-hmm. the whole idea, the whole thing that was so perplexing was like, I've had my other movies and I've, I, I know the negatives of it, right? Like I sure. sort of know, okay, this, this is probably not going to work or I get that critique. Mm-hmm. And I look at like, I, I mean, I love Infamous. Like I love the work I did on it. I love mm-hmm. the movie I made. And I'm, I feel like everybody that saw it that didn't, I knew people weren't going to like it, but a lot of people that like really vehemently are hate that movie. Mm-hmm. I feel like they saw a totally different movie than I saw. But that's the way it is with all art. And all art I know. is that. I know. It's, that's I know. just the way it is. Yeah. I mean, but, um, I mean, look, anyway, man, but, yeah, look no, Kubrick, no. every single time Kubrick put something out, everybody was like, this is horrible. Like 2001, horrible. Yeah. Clockwork Orange, right. horrible. The Shining, yeah. horrible. Full Metal Jacket, horrible. Eyes Wide Shut, horrible. Like, it, it, it doesn't matter. It's, yeah. As you as an artist, get it out there. And if it reaches an audience, that's all that you can do. Um, I'm going to ask you a few yeah. questions to ask all of my guests, sir. Um, yeah. What are three screenplays every screenwriter should read? Ooh. Um, let's see. What are some that I have? I have uh, what I have in there. I think that. I mean, I think that – let me think about it. I think that Magnolia is one of them, yeah. I think. PT, you can't go wrong with PT. Yeah, what? You can't go wrong with PT. can't Anderson. go wrong? Oh, no. No, you can't. He – there's just so many rules that are broken. Yes. You know, by his writing mm-hmm. that I think it's worth reading that. Um, gosh, what else? I think that um, – it's a good question. I don't. I don't go through and read a lot of scripts. What do I have? I have like I'll tell you what I have. I have Mystic River, which I thought was really really good. Was I have Traffic, a good... yes, which is really interesting. Um, I think you know people have kind of come around on it, but I think Chinatown is still a really good example of of, of screenwriting. Yeah, of course. You know? um, and um, I, you know, it's weird though because I look. I like to look at specific movies, like movies I really love. I'll go read those scripts. Sure, to see I how like to see, I like to just see, you know, um, just how it got put down on the page. Mm-hmm. You know, like, um, you know, so I, I love reading like Oliver Stone scripts. I love reading, um, um, I mean, Chris Nolan certainly, but like, you know, uh, P.T. Anderson. I just like, I like reading so much. I like reading these scripts of movies that are not traditional. Right. You know? They're not right. the obvious type of film because then you start to look at it and you go, well, how is this even put together? You know, and you start to see all the ways in which like the traditional screenwriting rules like mm-hmm. aren't adhered to, which I think is really exciting and really opens up 
really opens up new possibilities when you see that occur in other scripts and you go, mm-hmm. oh, like, let me try that. You know, I mean, it's the same thing with layovers. Like, let's wa- let's let's make a 10 minute dialogue scene. You're just like, nobody wants to do that. You know, right, right. All right. What is the lesson that took you the longest to learn, whether in the film business or in life? What is the lesson that took me the longest to learn film business or in life? Um, that it is. Own, that it is really only about the work that you do. That it's not about people's reaction to it. It's not right. about whether people like it. It's not about whether it sold, sells. Like you have to be happy with the work that you do because that is the only thing that's in your control. And what did you learn from your biggest failure? <sighs> biggest failure. Well, as a writer. I don't know if I have that as a writer. I would say that as a director, Mm -hmm. my biggest failure was moving away from an approach and a style that I liked and felt good about in an effort Mm -hmm. to try to – I don't want to say elevate something. In an effort – it was with the series, South Beach. Like I tried to do something in a style that wasn't me. Right, right. And aesthetic that wasn't me because I felt I needed to try and make it feel not brighter, but more, I don't know, like slicker, more mm-hmm. well produced. Mm-hmm. And I realized after the fact that that was a mistake, that I should have gone the stylistic route that I'm most comfortable with, you know, and that I feel the best with because that I felt is what gets me better performances and better movies. And where can people find you and your work and all the stuff you're doing? Uh, I'm on Twitter at Joshua underscore Caldwell. That's a good place to start because everything leads out from there. And then my works, I mean, you know, movies are now available. They're all available on iTunes, Amazon, Vudu, YouTube, kind of wherever, wherever movies are sold. <laughs> <laughs> Brother, man, I appreciate you coming on the show and, and sharing yeah, your wisdom uh, of the, in the shrapnel that you have taken. Always. Uh, and your movie award, sir. Um, yes. <laughs> on show. Slip, I had to slip that in somewhere. It's, I've never actually seen a you movie see award again? so can, close. I've never actually seen it so close before, so I appreciate yeah. that. <laughs> no, listen, I, I bust your balls about the movie award. I would have killed for a oh, every movie like, award. Like, I would have killed was, for what? <laughs> it was awesome. It was the coolest night of my life so far. You know? Dude, I got my first award at a film festival. I still have it. It's on my shelf. It was like oh, yeah. the be- it was like a best picture for my short, and I, I have a picture of me looking at it. Yeah, and I, I literally just like in awe of like, oh yeah, Mike, they like me. They like, me. they like me. They really you like really me. Like- <laughs> yeah. So, a pleasure as always, brother. Thanks again, man. All right, dude. Take care. Have a good night. I want to thank Joshua for coming on the show and dropping those indie film screenwriting knowledge bombs on the tribe today if you want to get links to anything we spoke about in this episode head over to the show notes at bulletproofscreenwriting.tv forward slash zero eight two and thank you all the tribe members who signed up for the new podcast inside the screenwriter's mind which is going to be a bi-weekly podcast and if you have not checked it out please head over to screenwritersmind.com sign up It is going to be the best of all of our podcasts in the Indie Film Hustle Podcast Network. So you guys can take a flavor of all of the podcasts that we have at the IFH Podcast Network. So thank you for listening, guys. As always, keep on writing no matter what. I'll talk to you soon. Thanks for listening to the Bulletproof Screenwriting Podcast at BulletproofScreenwriting.tv. 